Do you have comments about the lesson today? First time you've ever seen it? Just the way that I looked at it, that they, you know, they arrived maybe, you know, up to two years after he was born. But yeah, it is. Yeah, and I can see, I can see where you're coming from. I can definitely see where you're coming from. Um, and of course, they. Yes, their willingness to seek seek out Jesus Christ and um, um, I, I just pray that uh, it will be a lesson that will cause people to think. Um, I'm not sure exactly the direction that I'm going to go with it today. Um, I guess just stating what stands out the most to me because for those that are on YouTube we are discussing um, a lesson from Matthew chapter 2 about the wise men seeking out Jesus, baby Jesus. And as I started to say, I'm not exactly sure the direction that I'm finally going to end up with this lesson today, but the, the one thing that really stands out to me is the willingness of these men to seek the truth. Well, their willingness to seek out uh, the, the newborn king. And I know that there will be those that question the authenticity of Scripture. You know, did this really happen? And I guess that my question for them would be, what would be the purpose of talking about these men that were from a distant land showing up to see Jesus? Because the Jewish community had no respect for these magi. From the, and, and this book was written to Jews. This was written by Matthew. Matthew was a Jew. And we believe it was the Matthew of the Apostles, the one that was formerly a tax collector. And there would have been no value for him to include into his narrative a story about three men that came from a distant country because as far as the Jews were concerned, everybody else was a pagan. You know, they, they had no, no respect. And yet, Matthew has included this, and we believe that it is the truth. Um, I don't know if there was ever, it seems to me in the back of my mind years ago, I heard that there was a possibility of something written down in history about Herod, and I'm talking about outside, outside of the Bible, Herod having gone and killed babies. It seems to me that I had heard something about it. But, but what we do know about Herod, he was a ruthless man. And again, that fits the narrative. Because uh, Herod even, it's not recorded in the Bible, but history shows he even killed his own family members yeah. to keep from having, you know, the throne taken away from him. So, you know, I believe, we believe in the reliability, the authenticity of Scripture. You know, that these are not just made up accounts. They are factual accounts. In fact, Luke, who wrote the other, the most prominent, I don't know what Ed says, John chapter 1 is, is really the birth of Christ too, and the beginning was the Word. And it, it goes on to talk about, you know, that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But this, this passage of Scripture is, um, it is written to kind of give us an understanding of what all took place. Uh, and again, Luke gives us a, a record, and Matthew gives us a record, and Matthew records that these men, it doesn't specify where they came from, there's a lot of speculation where they came from, but they must have traveled a, a great distance because it apparently took them a long time. And again, that's probably the direction that I'm gonna try to emphasize with today's lesson is the willingness of these men to act in faith. I don't I don't know if if we've fully comprehended that, 
But for these guys to pack their bags and go on a mission um, that may have, you know, if it was from over in Babylon, might have been a thousand miles over there. I know in Ezra it talks about that Ezra took four months when he went back to, to help rebuild Jerusalem. He had a group of people that were with him. But this was a major excursion on the part of these men. I read someplace, and then I couldn't find where I read it. Three years. It took them. Well, we generally say two because Herod wanted all I the children two years. I always heard ago. two, but I read someplace where it was three. Well, and it could have been that they, they're doing that based on the star appeared before the birth of Christ. You know, that there could have been, the star could have appeared kind of as a sign in the heavens that... And then they followed. And, and the, Jesus hadn't been born yet, but it was something that appeared kind of as a, a warning sign that, that Jesus was on his way. But again, you, you're exactly right. That is, that is a major commitment on their part. And to faith does put your, and a star of all things to follow. And yes, um, and so that, that for me is the, the real message here because I don't know that we're always all that, we're all that sold on our faith. And I've said before, faith is not what you say you believe, faith is what you do. Actions speak louder words and furthermore you know these guys as we'll go through the narrative their willing to go willingness to go and approach Herod and ask him you know it's, it's one thing to, to basically come into a city it's another thing to go in and ask for an audience with the king and we explained that the other day that even though Jerusalem had a Jewish king that was appointed by the Roman emperor, um, Rome was under the rule of Caesar, and King Herod was kind of his pawn, because King Herod was Jewish, and King Herod really wanted to please the Roman emperor, so buddy, he, he reigned with a tight fist. And these magi went in and asked an audience of would you and I feel comfortable going to a strange country and asking for an audience with the king? I don't know what they knew about King Herod's proclivities to violence, but it makes you wonder, man, this guy has quite a reputation. You know, word gets around about how violent some people can be, and they still went and had this audience um, with the king, and then we'll get to this at the last part, when they showed up before baby Jesus, and we don't say infant because we believe that he might have been a year, maybe a year and a half, up to two years of age, they were living in a small house. How many of you, how many of you could, when you saw a child that day, bow down and worship that child? Now as much as grandparents love and adore their grandchildren, would you be willing to worship a strange child? Because the Bible says that they actually came, Matthew makes, and they bowed down reverently before him, and they presented these gifts. Um, and so for me, as I go through this lesson, that's probably what spoke to me the most, is just the faith that these men exercised. And I think that it should encourage us to grow in our faith. That, you know, as we see their example, and there are evidences in Scripture of the faith. For instance, the, the, the shepherds that had seen the angel and angels, you know, they said, let's go to Bethlehem. They made their way to Bethlehem to go see if everything that they'd been told was true. Um, they, um, when you take Simeon, you know, I, I don't know that we'll do it, but... Uh, I thought this wonder about us as a congregation singing Simeon, you know. But Simeon, you know, when Simeon has the baby Jesus in his hands, you know, he says, ah, my eyes have beheld salvation. You know, this is, this is faith. When you have Anna that basically, 
Yes, you know, this is, this is the Christ child. We, we see evidences of people that were willing to express their faith. Even Joseph himself, you know, saying when he was going to put Mary away because he found out that she was with child. And God said, no, don't do that. It's from me. And Joseph was willing to accept it. We see evidence of people that say, you know what? I do believe. I do believe. And I guess maybe I'm speaking to this some because... You know, with the loss of my younger brother, and by the way, I want to say thank you to y'all and everybody out there that has sent us cards and calls and text messages, and we really have appreciated the support. But when you lose a loved one, I think that your faith gets examined more than it ever has before. What do you really believe? And we keep coming back to this is what we believe, what the Word of God says. This has been the witness of the Christian, Christian community ever since the time of Christ. This is even what the apostles, Matthew, this is what Matthew believed. And um, our faith is in the person we're going to study today, Jesus Christ, that people came and they worshipped him. And so we will continue to worship him. We just may need to grow in our willingness to demonstrate our faith. And that's really what these wise men, the, as far as I'm concerned, it's the bar that they have set for all of us. They were willing to go to great lengths in order to worship Jesus Christ. So I know it's a long introduction. Y'all are kind of accustomed to those. But let's, uh, let's go to the first uh, passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Do we have a volunteer to read this? Clyde, will you? Thank you. The arrival. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at the rising, its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. Okay. So this was after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem the book doesn't really um, give us a lot of information on that um, it said in your book on page 39 the wise men came from the east it's um, in the commentary uh, the second paragraph down from where the scripture is the wise men came from the east. The identity of these men is a mystery. The term magi, some say magi, sometimes is used to describe them. The term could represent a Persian caste or astrologers and magicians from Babylon. Additionally, various scholars suggest that these men came because of the teachings of David, Daniel, or another prophet. The Bible does not provide an answer. However, one thing is indisputable. God compelled the wise men to find the king of the Jews, and the Lord used a star to guide them to the king. So, the book just basically says what I said in one short sentence. We don't know a lot about them. However, I think that it would be fair to say when they use the word mad, Magi, 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 depending on who you talk to, the pronunciation, that these were guys that weren't from Israel. You say, well, does that matter? Well, I'm only going to emphasize it because they came from a distant land. And we don't know exactly what distant land. I think that I... I got varying reports when I went and looked on the um, internet of how far it was. I think that one place I saw, I saw it said like 900 miles to Babylon from basically Jerusalem. Of course, Bethlehem is only six miles or five miles outside of Jerusalem. Another place said, uh, one said 900, one said like close to 1,500 miles. We do know, as I said from the book of Ezra, that, of course, Ezra, uh, I was under the impression that Ezra came from basically, uh, 
well, it was it was Babylon, uh, but the Babylonian Empire had ended. I guess they had been living in Babylon, but it took him four months to make the journey. So let's just pause here and ask ourselves the question: If you had, and I know that this is kind of hypothetical because none of us are astrologers. We're not astronomers. We're not magi. But how would you go about telling your families and whatnot that were around you that you were going to be making a trip because you'd been looking at the stars at night and you believed that based upon the strangeness of the star that something significant had happened? How would you go about explaining that to your family and friends? And if they ended up saying to you, how long will you be gone? You said, I, I don't know exactly. Well, will you be gone a month, six months, a year, two years? How, how would you go about telling somebody that? What would you say to your wife, your children, your grandchildren? Well, first I have to get used to the idea that I'm a magi. <laughs> <laughs> really, and they do whatever they want because they're important people. Yeah. And I think they could just tell us, tell us, hey, I'm going to go, you know. Do you not think that they would struggle with the same things that we struggle with? Like, how long is this going to take? Because obviously they gave some thought to it. They took gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We don't know how many people there are. We always stress that. We're into traditionally thinking that there were three of them, but that's only because of the three gifts. We, we have no idea how large uh, a group, a group it was. You know, we do know that when they showed up in Jerusalem, um, I think that it caused quite a stir. And so, anyhow, I, I just want us to contemplate this because I don't know that we really stopped to think about how awkward that would be. I know that that's, that's not the way that we operate, and I know that you say, well, they basically did anything that they wanted, uh, but I think about even retirees, you know, going to Florida for a week, two weeks, a month, two months, you know, there's exp extensive preparation because you realize that this is a trip of, of rather large importance. And so I just mentioned it that these guys, how would you go to break the news to your family and friends? Um, how many of them they were, they were taking? What's going to be done about all the stuff back home while they're gone? I mean, assuming that it did take up to two years to get there, did it take the same amount of time to get back? Can you imagine being gone almost four years? Well, they knew where they were going when they went back. They took a different route back, though. They didn't follow the same route. Well, they didn't go back to Jerusalem, you know. Yeah, yeah. They, they bypassed. Yeah, they bypassed it. But they probably talked about it when they saw that star. They probably talked about it with their family. Maybe. You know that there's something strange going on in the sky. They talked about it with people. But what I find strange, which, of course, it's God's plan, but these guys traveled all that distance, and it took them two years to go all that distance, and they found Jesus, but Herod couldn't find him. And he lived right there with him. Yeah, and I thought, that it was, I thought that it was interesting. It was the first time I think that I thought of it. Of course, the older I get, I might have had this thought before, that even the chief priests, you know, the religious leaders, even though they told Herod, you know, it's in Bethlehem, Apparently, none of them went to investigate either. They didn't put any stock in it. You know, it would have seemed to me that these religious leaders would say, I can't believe that these guys would travel all the way over here without somebody getting suspicious and saying, you know, because five miles is not all that far away, but these guys kind of went on apparently by themselves. And again, I know some people say, well, it sounds rather fictitious to me, but I, I'm going to throw it in again, you know. Why would Scripture include a story about these foreigners that showed up when Matthew is writing primarily to 
Jewish people, because they would have had no regard for, you know, these magi. And I'm just simply saying, of course, I, I don't want to get us into questioning the reliability, the authenticity of Scripture. But I believe the biblical account. I believe that this is a representative of the Bible is trying to teach us something. As I've said before, the Bible isn't there just to give us stories to remember. It's lessons to learn. Mm -hmm. And these guys, you want to talk about faith. I had you kind of think in your mind how you would explain it to your families. I mean, how would you react? I know that you said that you couldn't be a wise man. My dad said he was going to go on a trip and leave his family. Yeah. Or if Chuck, you know, is your husband, ends up saying to you. He'd say, good. You yeah, have your bags <laughs> off. You ain't left yet? I'm sure they got angry. You know, the family would get angry. They were going to leave them. And they didn't know when they were coming back. What kind of expectations did they expect? You know, when their loved one came back, what kind of a report were they expecting to hear? You know, this is a mighty big trip that you're making. Was the guy living in a palace? You know, is this going to be advantageous to us that you've basically come to worship him and, and recognize him? Is it, is it going to bring his favor toward us? And I, I'm only throwing this in there because, again, the lesson for me, the main thrust of it was the faith that these men had. That they and, and these men really didn't know one another either, did they? Because they all come from afar. I mean, did they really know one another, or did they just meet up? I would suspect that they were together. I mean, I, I don't know if, if you could interpret it from the original language, but I always took that they were part of the same group. I do believe that in those days there would have been a reluctance to travel alone. You know, and you know, one yeah. here, one here, and then because of the, the presence of thieves. And of course, these guys were carrying rather valuable gifts, and they, they would have, you know, needed to have security when there's security in numbers. But again, for me, just how do you break the news? I was looking at the sky last night, and I really feel like that something significant has happened, dear, and I need to. I got together with some friends of mine, dear, and we are going to go on a trip, dear. I don't think it was that way. You don't think it was that <laughs> no, way? No, I think they talked about it for months before they even left home. Probably. Because they saw that star and they studied it. And they probably lived in different towns and they went and traveled from town to town and talked to them. And, and, and you could be exactly right because they... I doubt seriously that they'd actually travel the entire two years because, as I said, Ezra, when he made the trip, it took four months. Yeah. So they could have spent an extensive amount of time, but still, this is faith. <laughs> this is faith being put into action. That even if they did discuss it, you know, there was planning on the parts of the family, and I don't know if they all kind of gathered at the, at the edge of town from where they were leaving and bid them a farewell and you know we wish you well and please hurry back as soon as you can you know there was expectations of of what was going to happen but again these guys were willing to go and it makes you wonder as they traveled what were they expecting to see if it would have been you what would you have expected to see when, when did they hear that, that there was a king of Israel born did, when did they find out that the star meant that there was a king born? Well, and again, that's why they speculate that if it was from Babylon or whatnot, back when Daniel was there in Babylon, you know, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they carried with them their Jewish faith. And it might have been from some of Daniel's writings that they, you know, pulled this and, and part of the Jewish faith. Because not only do we in our country tend to pull in bits and pieces of other faiths. They call that syncretism, where you basically try to synchronize your faith with others. And if you're not careful, your faith can be become like other faiths. And that's one of the things that we guard against within the Christian faith, is that we don't, we don't want to depart from what the Word of God says. But you find that these, these, um, these guys had heard about it somewhere, but they didn't, I don't think, I don't remember reading that there was a prophecy that a star was going to lead anybody to find them. No. 
So no. that's what the, the star is the reason they start. You gotta see what that star is all about, is what I'm thinking. Right. Well, unless, and this was the passage of scripture that my dad quoted the other night at the candlelight service. He said, um, and I can't quote everything that my dad had to say, but he did a really wonderful job. If you went to Isaiah chapter 9, no, that's the passage of scripture, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. But just prior to that, I think that my dad started in, I think it was the second verse. And you've heard this before. Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom. This is the first verse. There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. Here it is. Verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You know, now, now whether or not they had a copy of, and of course my dad used that to basically say, all of us live under the shroud of death, darkness. You know, that we're all living basically in the shadow of death. And now a light has been given. And Jesus says that he is the light of the world. And that light is something that drives away the darkness. We, we don't need to fear death, Jesus says. What did Jesus say to Mary and Martha? I'm the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me shall never die. And he that liveth and believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. There is light. And that's what people are looking for. And, and what scripture says, that a light is shown. And so whether it was looking at Isaiah's prophecy, for Isaiah lived roughly 700 years before the time of Christ. And these guys might have had access to that. And of course, when they get to Jerusalem, they talk with Herod in the passage of scripture from Micah. You know, thou Bethlehem. You know, and, and so they go to Bethlehem. So, but again... I, and I don't mean to sound like I'm a stuck record, but it just strikes me that these men would have that kind of faith. Because I, I look at myself, you know, would I be able to look at the night sky and see a strange light? And based on that, and it might have taken, as you said, months for these guys to kind of get together and discuss, if you can imagine the meetings that they had, you know, as various people offered their interpretations and suggestions, and then finally the decision was made. You know what? We really need to send a group of guys over there. And these ones that were elected had to go back and explain to their families that they were getting ready to make this trip. And it could be a long trip. I, I don't know how much was contributed financially with the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh. You know, they, they talk about that they think that the, that money, because Mary and Joseph were poor when they got ready to dedicate Jesus at the temple, they had to use two turtle doves. And so this happened after that, apparently. But when they went down to Egypt, Mary and Joseph probably used the funds from what the, the Magi had given them in order to basically support themselves. So, again, I don't, I don't mean to, to make this lesson difficult, but I am just trying to really drive home that these guys were exercising incredible faith. And I'm going to add at this point, before we go to the next passage of Scripture, they had not yet seen any of the miracles that Jesus did in his earthly ministry. They had not seen, you know, Jesus turn the water into wine. They had not seen Jesus walk on water. They had not seen Jesus... Feed the 5,000. And it begs the question, do you think that those guys really thought that Jesus could do all that? I don't know that they could, but they did know this much. Jesus was significant enough that they wanted to go and worship him. And it's strange that they would even worship somebody. Would, would you feel comfortable bowing down to worship somebody? What does bowing down and worshiping mean? It means that you recognize that somebody here is worthy of it. Giving out of self. 
And again, for them to just look and see Jesus, who's maybe one to two years of age, and we do believe as, as Christians that Jesus went through normal toddlerhood, you know, but for you to bow down and worship him. And then we take from scripture, these guys were overjoyed when they saw the star and they were convinced in their heart so that when they showed up, there was no hesitancy on their part. They presented him with the gifts and then they had to go back home. And it just makes me wonder as they started back home and their loved ones met them and say, well, what did you find? Was he living in a palace somewhere? And how did they know about Jesus? How did they know the star would lead them to Jesus? Well, and again, I think that that all goes with when they saw this strange star in the east. In, the, in this, from, it says star that's rising. From the light? I mean, from uh, what you just read the passage. Yes. Yes, a light has dawned from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Yeah. That they determined then that the kingdom of Jesus was born before they left. Um, yeah, yeah, because they do say here, where is he who has been born yeah. king of the Jews? You know, again, so, why would... So the news traveled all the way to that far land in two years or so, and still Herod has not found Jesus. Well, at least these guys had come to that conclusion that he was, that this star represented the king of the Jews. And My thoughts are worldly. worldly. Where were they going to eat? Where were they going to stay? Which direction do we follow? The star, that's all. Mm -hmm. Those are things I would think about if I was going on a trip. Yeah. Except, and I'll kind of throw this in there, it did say that they had come to the conclusion that he was the king of the Jews. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? So they knew, I think, that they needed to head toward the Jewish country of Israel. I think that that much had been determined. And it is... I mean, it would stand a reason that you would go to the capital city of Israel, which was Jerusalem. Well, they followed the star. That's but they did like, follow the star. That's like our astronauts today. All the study and everything, they went to the moon. But don't you think... But they didn't know what they were going to find. But why didn't other people follow them too? And again, why don't most people notice? See, and as we've even... Because it looks like somebody would say, hey, the news travels. Well, even the Jewish leaders that told Herod that he would be born in Bethlehem, apparently none of them, these were the, the religious leaders, they were the ones that told the Magi, you know, it's over in Bethlehem. Apparently none of them even ventured. And these were people, students of the Bible. They weren't interested. They weren't Herod interested. really wasn't interested until these guys came, I would say. I'm guessing. But you can just imagine, though, if, if it just started out like, say, the three guys, and if it took them that long, the news had to be spreading, and people are curious. It's like, well, let's just go see yeah. what is really going on with this. So, I mean, they would have a big group problem right. by then. And the Bible doesn't tell us everything. No. I mean, there could have been people for two years parading over trying to see in the yeah, I. I I would tend to think that people's attitude is more or less, they they're crazy. not interested, they're, they, they, they really crazy. don't care. And again, that just, what I'm trying to stress is that faith is what you're willing to act on. And these guys apparently refused to be dissuaded, you know, that nobody was going to curb their enthusiasm. They continued on their, on their journey, yes, Turtle? I don't even know who to say. Why well, want to see the baby is always been born already. Why want to see... An unknown baby, I do not know. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the way I feel about little babies. But, but mothers, they feel different. I want to see the baby. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, and I don't know. They say, where is he born, the, born king of the Jews? So maybe, you know, they understood that Jesus would still be small um, when, the, when they left on this journey. But it's just, again... These guys, we're going to go. We're going to go. They, they made the trip. If they ran into others, I'm sure that they ran into others along the way. Chuck, yeah, they had to plan out where are we going to spend the night? What are we going to eat along the way? It had to be very costly to make a journey of that length because you didn't have time to stop and work somewhere to, to basically earn enough money to buy food. So these guys were acting in faith. They, they made the trip and... 
they were even bold enough. I mean, this this they went there to Jerusalem to King Herod, and if he had a reputation, you know, to walk in his presence, where is the one that's born king of the Jews? And Herod, you know, uh oh, did we say something wrong? You know, they they could pick up on nonverbal stuff. Herod, of course, tried to play it cool. You know, I would. They, they say he's over there in Bethlehem. I tell you what, when you go over there and you find him, come back, let me know, so I can go worship him too. The one phrase that's in the lesson says the identity of these men is a mystery. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I I concur with that. Later on, I think in the teacher's book, it said that around the sixth century. Uh, they gave names to them. Uh, I forget what their names were. I should have. Yes. When we were kids. I didn't mark it in my book, but somebody came, and I'm only mentioning it that it wasn't until centuries later that somebody came along and added names to them. And again, we don't know that there were just three. We typically think, think of three because there were three gifts. But it does not say that there were three gifts. I mean, it doesn't say that there were just three three magi. So, anyhow, I think that we probably chewed on that passage long enough. They did. They said, where is he born, King of the Jews? We saw his star at the rising, and we have come to worship him. That means to bow before him and to recognize that he is worthy of worship. And when King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. So, any final questions on the first passage? How about the second passage of Scripture? Tell me. Thank you, Mrs. W. The direction. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Jerusalem, of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are no, are by no means less among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. Where you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. Okay, so when King Herod was asked this question, that got his attention. He was a jealous king. As the book points out, he had killed members of his own family because he didn't want his kingship challenged. So it said that he assembled all, all of the chief priests and scribes. Well, I uh, never had thought about it before. It said he wasn't fully a king. He was part this and part that. Well, his his heritage. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, he was not. He was fully, not fully Jewish. He not yeah, Jewish. he was not fully Jewish. Okay. Yes, but he had been put there as a king by Caesar, and uh, Caesar rewarded his loyalty. It's not unlike now that we see with our president, not just our current one, but previous ones. They will appoint people two positions of power, ambassador to this, ambassador to that, you know, and they're basically given some, some responsibility. I see in the uh, teacher's book the names by the end of the 6th century, the names of the Magi were Melchon, later Melchior, Balthazar, and Gaspar. But it says that those, those names were not given until the end of the 6th century, which would have been like the late 500s. That would have been the 6th century. So, they don't really know, though, no. Really. no. So, anyhow, I just wanted to emphasize this with the, uh, the chief priest. Um, he assembled all of the chief priests and scribes. And I thought that it was interesting that the um, teacher's book, I think it was, said that largely, I don't think that it was in the student book, the priests were, <laughs> this is kind of ironic, the priests were basically the Sadducees, and the scribes were pretty much the Pharisees, which I find is kind of interesting that the, the Pharisees, of course, believe in the resurrection of the dead. Um, I was trying to see if I could see that in the, um, kind of yeah, the majority of the scribes, this is what it says in the teacher's book on page 45, the majority of the scribes, these were the people that wrote the, yeah. 
they were Pharisees, so they believed in the resurrection of the dead, while the chief priests, those that did the sacrifices and stuff, they were part of the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the resurrection. But that goes along with the Apostle Paul. What was he? Was he a Sadducee or was he a Pharisee? He was a Pharisee. He believed in the resurrection of the dead. And of course, you remember when he was being hauled off to prison there in Jerusalem, he got a big uproar started by uh, saying, you know, I'm only talking about the resurrection of the dead. He pitted the two groups against each other so that they had to get him out of there. But um, he assembled, King Herod assembled all of the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them, hey, where does the scripture say the Messiah is to be born? And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea. Because this is what was written. But you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And so this came from Micah the prophet. The ruler is going to come from out of Bethlehem. So Herod, he secretly, he didn't do this everybody else. Bring those guys in here secretly. And he, he summoned them, and he asked them exactly when the star appeared. And uh, so apparently they told him, and so he sent them on to Bethlehem. And he says, you go and you make a search for this child, and when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. So their journey wasn't over. They had another five miles to go, and it said when, of course, we'll get to that next part. When they looked up, they saw the star, and they were overjoyed. <laughs> It was, it was still there. And it raises questions. This is one of the things that people have trouble doing with. Even, I'll be honest, I have a hard time understanding. It says that it went and stood over the place where Jesus lay. You know, I almost envision that as being like a spotlight. You know, on a stage. That it shines. We have never seen that kind of a focused light beam before. You know, it, and it's kind of, we know too what the stars typically, and I know they say they're going through outer space or whatnot, but what changes is the, the earth is spinning. Yeah, the, the earth is spinning. It's not that the stars are necessarily moving around all that much, although, you know, stars can be moving at speed of light through space. I don't claim to know it all. But at any rate, it's that causes some people problems like how did this whole light show work? You know? Yeah, they can only travel at night because they can't see the sun in the daytime. Yeah, so that's a lot of hours <laughs> lost when you think about it. Well, it, it could have been. Um, you know, I I was going to comment this earlier. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Turtle. Maybe they, they sleep at daytime and they wake up at nighttime and go walk at nighttime. Well, or they could have just said, we see the direction that we need and travel in the daytime. I don't know about the traveling at night, but here's what I was going to say. The uh, rescued Americans recently from down in Haiti, the ones that had been held captive, mm -hmm. did you read anything about how they got out of there? Yeah, but how did it happen? No. They made a daring escape at night. They had to go past several of the prison guards and stuff like that. They, they really put their lives... They'd been praying for a long time, Lord, should we go? And then they finally decided to make a break for it. And they had to basically sneak past people. But here's the part that said that once they got away from these people, they followed the stars. <laughs> oh, I didn't. I already read it. They... They, were, they knew enough about, you know, we can set our sights based on this and we can move in this direction and they were eventually able to get to an area where they could make a phone call and contact and, and get rescued. But I'm only bringing it out because of the use of stars. And these guys, this is what they did. Um, they, they got the instruction from Herod, you know, that he's in Bethlehem. And they said, okay. And so... Herod says, when you go there, you know, search carefully for the child. You know, it's been a long time. <laughs> Maybe up to two years. You do go make a careful search. You know, a lot can happen in two years. And um, 
When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. Um, and again, these guys, I, I, I'll just take one quick moment here. Would you have stayed at it for that long? I don't know what the longest no. trip is that you've ever been on. We would have to be in their position. I mean, as the type of people we are, we wouldn't, I couldn't. We're spoiled. Person I am. But if I was a, a wise man. How, and I, I'm just trying to, trying to stress that, yeah, you say we're not in their position. But, again, I'm using it to emphasize that as a sort of faith. Most of us would give up. And that one of the songs we used to sing in the choir was never, never, never give up. Never give up, never give up. I don't know if you remember that song or not, but it really got the message across. And these guys, what was that? They didn't you give up. You can compare that to us here in this church. Yeah. Yes. We have Absolutely. a star to follow. Are we following it? Absolutely. And that's, that's, what I, that's what I'm really, I guess, at the heart of what I'm trying to get across today is faith is not what you say you believe. It's what you continue to do. And I know that when I did the, um, when we did the candlelight service last Sunday night, what song did we start with? What song do we usually start? Oh, come. What, what, but again, I tried to emphasize what about, what word out of that, that song intro? Oh, come all ye faithful. Be full of faith. Continue. In your quest for Jesus Christ. Don't give up on Jesus. You know. That's what faithful means. It's full of faith. And these guys. And of course I didn't focus much the other night. I got to think of later. I should have. How should we come? Joyful and triumphant. We should come absolutely convinced. That we know. The way. The truth. And the life. And that's what these guys, you know, I, I just raised the question. Do you think that a week into their journey, they start to say, guys, it's been a long time. You think maybe we need two weeks into their journey, three weeks into their journey, four weeks into their journey? If it did take, like with Ezra, if it took four months, would you stay on a journey for four months? Would you refuse to stop until... You had basically got what you had, you had set out for. And these guys apparently said, you know what? We are not going to go home until we find you. And so they go. That takes us to the last passage of Scripture. Well, the one statement there on page 39. Okay. God compelled the wise men to find the king of the Jews. Yes. Mm -hmm. They yes. knew what they were going for, you know. Yes. And I'm glad you bring that out, Chuck, because um, I feel like that the Lord compels people a lot of times to, to seek Him. To do and, things. And you're never going to, even us giving our hearts to Jesus Christ, we knew that there was never going to be any peace until we accepted Him into our hearts. How many of you resisted the call of Jesus on your life at first. Have you seen in church the white knuckle invitation in where the people grab the pew so hard just fighting? They know. They know that God is calling their name. Jesus is tenderly calling. Calling today. Calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thy room? Something, you know, don't turn him away or respond today or something like that. But it was these guys, they said, you know what? We feel compelled. We've got to we've got to answer this call. And apparently the rest of the world was totally oblivious. When you use the word compelled, that's a strong word. It is. You know. And uh... have you ever felt compelled by Miss Bessie to do something? Was it <laughs> no. No, no comment. <laughs> have you ever lied? <laughs> He's crossing his finger. Um, so yeah, they, they did. And I just say, 
You know, there are people that struggle with, do I accept Jesus Christ? And these, these guys are an example to us. They believed. And again, they did not know everything else about Jesus that we know. All that they knew is that they needed to act on the information that they had. And they went in obedience. And they said, we are not going to stop till we get there. And so Herod says, you know, even though it might have been up to two years, who knows where he is? Go search for him carefully, you know? One, one more thing they did. Yes. They left everything. Yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. You mean as far as their gifts? Their family. Oh, yeah. Their, their life. Yes. Their lifestyle. Yes. Whatever they were doing. That's, that's what Jesus says. If you don't love me more than family, mother, father, brother, sister, you can't be my disciple. And these guys, they did. They left their home. They left, they left everything for Jesus. Now, we don't know that they continued to serve him when they went back to wherever they came from, but they had come and they had given him their worship. And so, uh, last passage of Scripture. Read that for us, Sheila. The discovery. After hearing the king... They went on their way, and there it was, the star they had been they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, with his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Okay. So after hearing the king, it says they went on their way. And there it was. <laughs> what was? The star they had seen at its rising. And I think the old King James, the star they had seen in the east. But which direction does the, does the sun rise? In the east. But they had seen this at its rising, and it led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. And again, I can't explain that. I, I don't know, but it was something that they, they, they saw. The rest of the world was pretty much clueless to it. No. And then in the 10th verse, it says, when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. They were glad. It makes you wonder how long they'd maybe been traveling without seeing it. They had just continued to, to be obedient to what they knew in their heart. And they saw that star. It was confirmation that, yes, we are doing the right thing. They were overwhelmed with joy, just absolutely ecstatic. I mean, you could imagine if they'd been on the road for months and months and months. Oh, man, we're so close. And so entering the house, it doesn't say entering the stable. Apparently Mary was there in a house. They saw the child with Mary's mother. And what did they do? Falling to their knees. They did what? They worshipped him. And people saying, I don't think that I should be worshipping anybody except God. No. Worship Jesus Christ. Worship Jesus Christ. These guys got down on their knees and they worshipped. And people say, oh. Why would you worship? Because he is worthy of worship. It would take, you know, decades later as, as the apostles, they spent time with Jesus. They came to understand Jesus, who he really was. I think that they were just blown away when they saw, they, when they saw the miracles of Jesus. What, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, they, they came to understand that he wasn't just a person. He was God. And it led to declarations of faith like the Apostle, Apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God. Even Jesus Christ himself said to the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So it said they fell to the work, worshipped him, they opened their treasures, presenting with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so they, they gave him the best that they had. And it's an encouragement to us to bring to Jesus the best that we have. And then finally it says that 12th verse, being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. And I'd never really thought about it before, but Matthew really emphasizes the dreams. Mm -hmm. For instance, when he was going to put Mary away, 
And that was in Matthew chapter 1. In a dream, an angel spoke to him and says, Hey, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Then you've got these wise men, these magi, that were warned in a, in a dream. Following that, Joseph, in a dream, is warned, Hey, you better go to Egypt. Later on, he's given another dream. It's safe to go back, but you need to go to a different area. And so I just mentioned that because God does work through dreams. And, uh, so anyhow, I pray that the lesson might be, again, be an encouragement to us to uh, exercise our faith. Not just what we say, but what we do. <coughs> well, thank you. We'll have a closing prayer here. Chuck has to go. You can go ahead and go, Chuck. You can go ahead and go. Okay. Well, let's pray. <coughs> Father, thank you for the lesson today about these magi and their, their faith. Father, may it be an encouragement to us to keep our faith in your Son. In fact, Father, this could be a challenge to us to, not that we do it to try to outdo them, but Father, may it be reminded to us that faith is one of those things that we exercise without ever giving up. And these men certainly exercise that faith, traveling a long distance. We didn't even get to talk about what the welcome home must have been when they went back and tried to explain to their families and all their friends what they had seen. Father, I pray that we might keep our faith in your Son. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that a light has shined. That, Father, we do live in the shadow of death, but we're grateful that we've got the light of the world, your Son, Jesus Christ, who gives not only light, but life. We pray that we might remain faithful to him and share him with others, that they too might come to know Jesus Christ, Lord of all. May this lesson be blessed to our lives, us to your service. Have your will and your way in the service to follow. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.